Welcome to our foreclosure education program. We're here to help you learn your legal rights, save your home, and limit your financial liability. I am attorney Sylvia McLean. I am the executive director of the Seminole County Bar Association Legal Aid Society. We are a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services to low-income families in Seminole County. One of our areas of practice is foreclosure. Seminole County has experienced a dramatic increase in foreclosures. Um, so we are here to provide you necessary information to help you. Let me provide you some slides regarding the foreclosure rate in Seminole County. In the four-county Orlando metropolitan area, which includes Seminole, Orange, Osceola, and Lake, we are ranked the third nationally in the rate of foreclosure actions filed in the court system since March 2013. Metro Orlando had 3,200 foreclosure filings recorded in court, with one foreclosure action for every 291 homes. Seminole County exceeded the statewide average. As you can see from our slide, nationally, the foreclosure rate is 12%. For the state of Florida, it's 32%. And for us in Seminole County, 43% foreclosure rate. Inside Seminole County, the top five cities with the highest foreclosure rate is Castleberry with one in every 208 homes in foreclosure, Oviedo one in every 211, shortly followed by Sanford which usually leads, is the leader among the top five cities in foreclosure at one in every 224 homes, Altamont one in every 28 and Lake Mary, one in 237 homes. We have the dubious honor in Seminole County to have the highest zombie foreclosure rate in the Metro Orlando area. What is a zombie foreclosure? It is a vacant home where the homeowner has decided to leave the house rather than face a foreclosure or take any legal action they walk away and they leave their home vacant. They do not exercise their legal rights and options. Our presentation today is to help you, help Seminole County lower the zombie foreclosure rate. Um, once you know your options, you can make better decisions than just to walk away. We have gathered a distinguished panel of experts to talk about foreclosure and share their knowledge and expertise. I would like to introduce the panel for you today. Our first panel member is um, attorney Stephen Kramer. He is a Florida foreclosure attorney. He has been recognized in, as a best lawyer in America for 2012 and 2013. He is recognized as Florida best lawyer in 2013, recognized as top lawyer in Orlando by Orlando Magazine in 2012 and 2013, and he's a weekly guest on the Monsters in the Morning in 1041 WTKS Orlando and nationally on Series XM. Thank you, Steve. Um, Maria Espinosa is an attorney. She has been an attorney since 1987. She is a Florida Supreme Court certified family mediator since 2007. She's a Florida Supreme Court certified circuit mediator since 2009, which handles foreclosure mediations. Um, she was admitted to practice in the United States District Court for Middle District of Florida in 2011. And she is the president of the board of directors of the Seminole County Legal Aid Society. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, attorney Yvonne Alonso. She was admitted to the Florida Bar in 2007. She's a staff attorney with the Seminole County Legal Aid Society for the last six years, 
She practices in the area of foreclosure defense. She's a former board of director and affiliate outreach chair for the Seminole County Young Lawyers Division. Thank you, Yvonne, for participating. Then we have Rosemary Hayes. She's a certified housing credit counsel for Credibility, which is a local nonprofit financial counseling agency. One of her responsibility includes assisting homeowners complete the application process for the Florida Hardest Hit Program, and we will be discussing that program. Um, many individuals in Seminole County are unaware of how effective that fund is if you can access it. And what we have done today is we have gathered and compiled questions, the most commonly asked questions that we receive um, in foreclosure um, consultations. So let's get started. I hope that you learn and that you are able to make wise decisions after you hear this valuable information. Um, my first question is to Steve. Um, this is a question I receive every day when I handle a foreclosure um, consultation. I receive foreclosure court papers. What shall I do? Okay, I'm Steve Kramer. I'm a uh, Florida foreclosure attorney, and the question is, um, once you're sued for foreclosure, what do you do? And the answer is, the, the thing you definitely don't do is you don't do nothing. Meaning, if you do nothing, what will happen is you will lose the case, you will lose your home, and you will be evicted, um, possibly in a very um, short period of time. What you should do is defend the case. And there's a couple things you can do to, to defend the case. One is you can hire an attorney. And that's always a good idea because, you know, maybe you understand the court processes, maybe you understand um, the rules that apply in a foreclosure case or in any case in court. Maybe you understand the difference between a motion to dismiss or an answer. You know, maybe you did go to law school um, and maybe you understand the process. But if you don't, it might be a good idea to sit down with an attorney um, because an attorney can help you through that process. And one of the things that you need to do when you're served with a lawsuit or when you're sued for foreclosure is you need to file a response. Now, there's two ways you can respond. One way is by filing a motion to dismiss, and the other way is by filing an answer. Now, an answer is what it sounds like. You're sued, there's a complaint filed, and you answer it by saying that you either deny or admit the allegations against you. And an allegation is, uh, is a um, statement like, you owe money. You haven't paid your mortgage. So you would admit or deny those. The other option is you can file a motion to dismiss. And in a motion to dismiss, you're actually not answering the complaint. You're actually saying, this complaint isn't even good enough to file an answer. It needs to be fixed. And usually, in foreclosure cases that we handle, that's where we start. Because many, many times, there are defects in the complaint that they file. Their lawsuit isn't filed properly, and they are, um, they're missing facts that they need to put in there. So that's where we start. Okay, and Steve, how many days do I have before I need to do a motion to dismiss or an answer? When you're served, you'll be uh, issued a summons, and generally somebody will knock on your door, and it may be uh, somebody in a sheriff's uniform or a police officer, or it may be somebody in plain clothes, and they will generally hand you a copy of the complaint, and then on top of that, it will have a summons, and it'll have your name on it, and then it will have information, and that information will usually say how much time you've got to respond. Now, um, a lot of times, that amount of time is 20 days, meaning 20 days from the day you're served, you have to file a response. Um, occasionally, it can be 30 days, but usually the summons will say that on there. And what happens is, if you file your response within the 20 days, then you have raised a defense and you, uh, then you can go ahead and defend your case. If you don't file a response, and remember this response is either a motion to dismiss or an answer. If you don't file a response, then you lose by default. And what happens is, after the 20 day or the 30 days expires, the, uh, the attorney for the bank can go in there and they can file a motion for a default. And then the, the court or the clerk will issue a default, which means that you lose automatically. And then after that, they can go ahead and they can get a uh, judgment. And uh, after they get that judgment, the property can move very quickly to a sale. And then after that, very quickly to a, uh, essentially an eviction where you're thrown out on the street. The other option is that you defend it. And if you do, you know, you open up a huge window. And it's not just the window of time that you get, because you're going to get a whole lot more time to um, stay in your home, to figure out the next step to um, raise defenses, 
but you're also going to get the opportunity for leverage. And leverage is important. Leverage is what makes the bank negotiate with you. When the bank has something to lose, when they've got to spend time and money prosecuting a foreclosure, that costs them something. And that means they've got to deal with you. That means that they've got, they, they've got an incentive to give you something. And you know, one of our other panelists is going to talk about modifications. And we've got another one that's going to talk about mediation. But by defending the case, you open up all these opportunities. So really, the key is to start defending a case and, uh, and really to get an attorney. So what I'm hearing is that it's very, very important to act within those 20 days in order that you can um, leave yourself with options on trying to negotiate with the bank and trying to save your house or lower your financial liability. Another question that I receive a lot, and Steve, I'm just going to ask you um, w one more question. How long can they stay in the house once the foreclosure is filed? If you do nothing, if you abandon the property, um, or if you stay in the property and you don't respond to the lawsuit, you can be evicted um, and lose the property very, very quickly. If you defend the lawsuit, um, like, like I mentioned, you've got a huge opportunity to defend the case, to do modifications, to complete a short sale, to do mediation. And that process can go on for a very long time. You know, and I don't want to get into too many legal um, intricacies, but basically by raising a motion to dismiss, um, there'll have to be a hearing on that motion. And that, that hearing may not be for two months, four months, six months. Now, once that hearing happens, um, if you've got an attorney that really is going to dig in and if there's a legal basis for it, meaning we've got something to stand on, we'll file a motion for reconsideration, asking the court to look again at that motion to dismiss um, and, and take a look at some other law that supports our position. And what that does is that opens up the window even more. And then after that, after that motion to dismiss that, that we talked about in the beginning is, is ruled upon, um, then you can also file an answer. Um, and at the same time, you can file a counterclaim, which is where you actually bring charges against the bank. Maybe the bank didn't comply with some laws like the Truth in Lending Act. Maybe um, the bank committed fraud. Maybe there's some other problem. Maybe you've got some claim against the bank. Or maybe you've been paying your mortgage. You know, and we've seen those cases where people are actually paying their mortgage and they're sued for foreclosure. And if they, the sad thing is they're actually paying their mortgage, but if they did nothing, they would lose, they would lose their house. The, the point is that there are many, many steps in the process. One of those is mediation um, that, that Ms. Espinoza is going to talk about. Um, but there are many, many steps in the process. And a foreclosure can last a very long time. And our goal, if we represent you in a foreclosure, or any attorney's goal, should be to open up that window for as long as possible. So you can get to the point where either you are getting out of that house through loss mitigation, or you're going to keep that house um, by, through loss mitigation, or you come to some other resolution of the bank so that you never, ever have to come to the point where you just lose the house unless it's on your terms. So, Steve, the most important thing I see is that um, the answer depends on the type of action you take when you receive your foreclosure complaint or before, and we're going to talk about that. But another question that we receive is the bank's lawyer wants us to mediate. What is mediation? Maria, you're a Florida Supreme Court circuit mediator, and you handle mediations in foreclosures daily. Can you please um, tell us what mediation is? Certainly. Mediation is a voluntary process. It is typically a meeting that is held between two litigants or two parties in a litigation and a third party neutral who is the mediator. Once you set the mediation and you come to mediation, or if you are ordered to mediate, please be aware that if you're under a court order to mediate, you must abide by the order and show up to mediation. However, it is still a voluntary process. Once you are there, you can participate as much as you want or as little as you want. The goal of the mediator is to try to ensure that the process allows you to discuss the issues in your case and possibly reach a resolution of the issues or an agreement. The mediator, as a third party neutral, is there to assist in this communication between the parties. Now, mediation is confidential, so there will be no recording of the mediation. There is no court reporter, as in a deposition or a court hearing. Uh, so it is confidential with very few exceptions to the law. Um, so also, it is a voluntary process, as I said. You can participate as little or as much as you want to participate. So specifically about foreclosure mediations, there is on the 18th Judicial website for Seminole County, 
several uh, administrative orders. There is one specifically on foreclosure mediations that you can look up and, and read about. There are also foreclosure procedures listed on there. When you go to foreclosure mediation, you might be either sent a notice of mediation or there may be a mediation center or a mediator trying to set a date for the mediation. If you wish to participate in the mediation, it is very important that you do try to come to a mutually acceptable time and date so that to ensure your appearance at the mediation because one of the things a mediator is required to do is to file a mediation report at the end of the mediation. And that report will simply state to the court that the mediation took place, who participated in the mediation, and a brief statement about the outcome of the mediation. Was there an agreement? Was there not an agreement or what we call an impasse? Did a party fail to show up at the mediation and therefore is noted as a failure to appear, which then the mediation cannot take place? Or in some cases, did the parties agree to continue the mediation? That mediator report is filed with the court, so that is not confidential, but a mediator is required to do that. So if you wish to participate in the mediation, try to set it at a date that you can attend. If you have been noticed and the notice has been mailed to you and it is not a date that you can attend, then try to reach the center or the mediator and try to reset the mediation and have it re-noticed at another time. Um, Maria, who pays for the mediation? Typically foreclosure. The bank is, is the one that's going to pay for the mediation. All right. And who um, usually is present at the mediation? Okay, present at the mediation, and this is a big surprise to some defendant homeowners. The states have allowed, the state courts have allowed the bank officer or the bank representative to appear telephonically. However, the bank attorney will be present at the mediation. Likewise, the defendant homeowners have to be present at the mediation and your, your attorney, if you have an attorney representing you in the litigation and the mediator. And how should I prepare for mediation? Is there something that you have to do or can I just show up? Uh, definitely, it is better if you prepare for mediation. Frequently what happens at mediation is that the bank will inform the party that they have not filed a complete packet for modification. The bank at mediation will want to ask you, what are your intentions with the home? Do you intend to stay in the home and modify your existing mortgage? Or do you intend to vacate the home, as Steve spoke about? Um, it is very important, very, very important, I can't stress this enough, that if you intend to modify your mortgage, uh, that you have already submitted a packet, a complete packet, to the bank, hopefully a couple days before mediation so that the bank has had a chance to review you for a modification. What is a complete packet? To simply put it, when you first applied for your mortgage when you bought the home, you probably had the assistance of a mortgage broker or a mortgage lender. And the, the documents were quite voluminous. They want uh, to see a financial snapshot of you. Well, they are reevaluating you now for a modification. So there are specific forms that they will send you in that packet, but they will also require you or ask you to furnish additional information regarding bank statements, your employment verification, and so forth. You, in good faith, may think that you have turned over a complete packet of modification, but it may not be deemed like that because there may be missing documents or some of the documents may be uh, inaccurately filled out or not completely filled out. They also will look to three months prior to the mediation or prior to your review. Anything that you have submitted prior to those, uh, older than those three months, that will be considered stale and they will ask you to uh, update or furnish additional information. So, of course, the help of an attorney in filling these out is very useful. Um, because as I said, when you initially applied, you probably had the help of someone who is very familiar with these forms and the application process. So to have an attorney experienced in foreclosure law is very important because they will help you fill out this packet and supply all the necessary documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, if you're at mediation, and it's also good to note that the bank will tell you at that point what you're missing, what you should uh, enhance your package, what you should provide, and they will give you a single point of contact, which is a, a name and number for a person from the bank who will now be dealing with you after the mediation and you will furnish additional documents to this person. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Maria. That was very informative. It's very important to prepare for mediation so that you can have a successful mediation and a possible resolution to your case. Um, another question that we receive is, I'm unemployed. I can't make the payments. What do I do? The bank keeps asking me for the mortgage payments. And we have Rosemary, um, and she is a um, certified housing counselor. What can you do? Well, first of all, uh, Credibility is uh, one of the HUD-approved agencies that are assisting with the Florida Hardest Hit Program. And uh, that program is a government program for homeowners who find themselves unemployed or underemployed. Um, and uh, there's a couple of ways you can apply. The most common is to go on the Florida Hardest Hit website. It will also explain on the site uh, what the requirements are, and you can actually complete your application right there uh, on the site. If you want assistance with the application or um, you have questions before you decide if you want to apply, then you would uh, give credibility a call and, uh, and then we can answer your questions and assist you with the application if you need to. Now, there are two parts to the program. And one is the unemployment uh, mortgage assistance. And what that is, is it's a combination of uh, making your monthly mortgage payments for up to 12 months, uh, cap at 24000 and uh, if there is a delinquency, assisting with that up to 18000 now, the second part of the program is reinstatement assistance, bringing your mortgage current. And um, if you're qualified, then um, you can receive up to $25,000 uh, for that arrearage. And what are the eligibility requirements for the Florida Hardest Hit? Well, first of all, you do have to be a Florida resident. You have to be either a U.S. citizen or a legal alien. Um, the home that you're concerned about has to be your primary home. Uh, and uh, the uh, balance of your mortgage needs to be below $400,000. Uh, the reason for the unemployment would be through no fault of your own such as uh, there was a budget cut and you were laid off or the company you worked for went out of business and you lost your job um, or in the area of underemployed maybe your hours were reduced or maybe your salary was cut back due to the economy uh, so those are you know uh, some of the the qualifications that you need to consider, you know, when you're applying for this assistance. Rosemary, it sounds like a wonderful program. Do they have to pay back the money um, that they receive if they are um, receiving money to catch up um, the mortgage? Well, um, what happens is there is a zero interest forgivable loan, okay? And every year, that you live in your home, the amount that the program assisted you with will reduce by 20%. If you stay in the home for five years, the balance will be zero and you won't owe anything. But if before that five-year period is up, you should decide to sell your home, then whatever that remaining balance is, you would be required to pay back through your sale proceeds. And Rosemary, we get um, many people that are disabled. They have permanent mm -hmm. disability and they're unemployed. Would they qualify for the hardest hit fund? If it's a permanent disability uh, where they're not going to be going back to work, 
uh, then um, unfortunately they would be disqualified for that assistance. However, let's say you're working and you have surgery or you become ill and maybe you're out of work for a few months and uh, you go to go back to work and you no longer have your job, but you're now well enough to where you can look for another job and you uh, can provide uh, uh, proof that you're trying to get another job, uh, then this is something that you can be considered for the assistance. Oh, thank you. That was very informative. Um, we see many individuals facing foreclosure, and one of the things that they say they um, most is, this is so stressful. I just want to walk away. I don't want to stay in my home. Yvonne. What advice would you give an individual that wants to just walk away from their home because they cannot stand the stress? Sylvia, I would advise them not to walk away. It's probably one of the worst decisions that you can make. If you're going to try to save your home, whether it be through a modification or to explore a foreclosure alternative, such as a deed in lieu, a short sale, something to that effect, you want to make sure that you're residing in the home. You're going to exclude yourself from um, some modification programs should you choose to leave your home without first becoming educated in the issue. Um, what are my options if I don't want to walk a away, Yvonne? Um, if you want, a lot, I see a lot of people that want a mortgage modification. They want to stay in their home, they want to continue to make their mortgage payments, but they need a more affordable mortgage payment. There are several programs available to do that. Um, some of the more common ones are HAMP, the Home Affordable Modification Program. Um, that program has a fantastic website. You can Google it and find it very easily. Um, there are uh, FDIC modification programs available. There are private modification programs available through each individual lender. Um, the most important thing you must do is apply for these. If you sit and you do nothing, then you're not going to receive offers for these. It's important that you stay active in the foreclosure process, that you seek assistance from an attorney, um, and that you just are aware of what's going on. If you don't want to modify your loan, you don't want to stay in your home, there are options. Um, some of those I mentioned earlier were a deed in lieu of foreclosure. That is basically saying to the bank, I want to give you back my house. I want to give you back the deed. I don't plan to stay in it, and I don't want to go through the foreclosure process. It's important that when you do that, you make sure that the agreement contains a deficiency waiver which is the difference between the amount that you would owe on your mortgage and what the house would sell for. Similar to that is a short sale. Um, I have a lot of clients that stay in the home. They're not paying their mortgage payment, but they want to go through the short sale process. I would encourage you to contact a real estate agent that is familiar with short sales so that they can assist you properly. Um, in those as well, you want to make sure that the deficiency amount is waived so that you're not going to be responsible for some sum of money after the entire thing is done. All right. Um, Yvonne, um, many individuals don't have any money, and they come to us and they say, um, I don't have any money for legal representation. I can't um, afford an attorney. What would you say to those individuals? Okay. Well, when I was introduced, I was told to be a staff attorney with Seminole County Legal Aid. Seminole County Legal Aid provides free legal assistance to qualifying individuals. So if you cannot afford an attorney, then you should contact our office. Uh, you can find us online at www.scbalas.com. You can Google us if you don't write that down quickly enough, Seminole County Bar Association Legal Aid Society, or you can contact us by phone at 407-834-1660. All right. And if you um, don't qualify um, under the financial guidelines of the legal aid program, is how can you retain the services of an attorney? Um, I hear attorneys are extremely expensive. Um, Steve, do you have any opinion on that? I do. If you don't qualify for legal aid, um, that's not a good reason to not defend your case. That's not a, re a good reason to not get an attorney. Now, there's a few ways that attorneys tend to charge for cases. Uh, one of those ways is hourly. And most people have heard about how attorneys bill by the hour, and that is where you pay the attorney for the work that they do. And the good part about it is that the attorney is incentivized to work and that they only get paid for the work that they do. Um, the bad thing about hourly payment is that it can tend to be um, unfriendly to a budget because you can't predict what your fees might be from one month to the next. All right. Um, 
Another way that some attorneys charge is a flat fee. And a flat fee can work very well in something like a will or a um, uncontested bankruptcy or drafting a corporation, for instance. Because in each of those scenarios, we know exactly what it takes to get to point A, from point A to point B. I know exactly what it takes to prepare a will. I've done a thousand of them, all right? So I can charge you a flat fee and I can charge you a fee that's reasonable to do it. But in a litigation case, which is what a foreclosure is, there is no point A to point B. It could be point A to B to Z to D to E to Z. It could be anywhere in between. And the problem is, a lot of times, if you hire an attorney on a flat fee basis, then they're not incentivized to do the work that needs to be done. And what you want is a result. And that's why you hire an attorney. So some attorneys, and, and we're one of them, have kind of come up with a, uh, a hybrid idea to help people afford an attorney. So we still represent people on an hourly basis, just the way most attorneys do. But the other thing we do is we charge people a flat monthly fee. And that means that they pay a fixed fee every month. And the good thing is, I like, I like scenarios where your attorneys are lined up with their clients and incentives. And here, our incentive is to get the client more time. Because what you need is time to complete the modification, time to complete a, uh, a short sale, time to um, process the Florida Hardest Hit program, time to do mediation. What you want is a window. And our job is to get you that window. And when you pay us on something like a flat monthly fee, then we're incentivized to get you the next month. In fact, we're incentivized to keep the co case open for as long as possible. And we've got cases that go back, you know, two years, four years. We've got, a case, we've got cases that go back to 2003, and it's 2013 right now. So that gives you an idea of the window that can be opened. Um, and, and when you find an attorney, you want to make sure it's a reasonable fee that you can afford because you don't want to get into something that you have to get out of. But a lot of times, our fee is less than you could rent the house for if you moved out, less than you would pay in another house, less than you would pay for a studio apartment, way less than your mortgage is, and it's very affordable and budget friendly. And Steve, you would be also helping them um, qualify for um, a, a HAMP modification or some other way to resolve their legal issue, right? Goal, you would help them with that. Absolutely. The goal is to get to a result. All right. The goal is to either get you out of the property without owing money or to get you into the property, meaning you keep the property, or um, to get a principal reduction where you owe less on your loan than you did before. So, you know, we had a client that we defended for three years. We never thought anything good was going to come of it. I mean, the bank was totally unwilling to negotiate. We tried everything that could be tried. But we kept on litigating, and this is where we get that back to that leverage thing, and we kept putting pressure, and eventually the bank came back and they turned a $230,000 mortgage into a $90,000 mortgage, and our client was ecstatic. Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes that's what you need. Um, just this week, I also handled foreclosures, and I saw an individual who's had serious um, medical issues. She had four surgeries, but during all that time, she tried to negotiate with the bank. She was working. Um, she tried for eight months to get a loan modification, and then um, the bank said, no, I, we're not going to give you a loan modification. Um, we are going to go ahead and sell your house. She was so afraid of what that bank representative said without any um, advice, without going to a HUD certified counselor for housing advice, without going to any attorney, without participating in mediation, she packed all her belongings. She moved to an apartment that she barely can afford. She sold all her um, belongings and left her home vacant in Seminole County. That's a zombie foreclosure, and that's what we're trying to prevent. And unfortunately for her is once you vacate the home, the bank loses complete um, um, incentive to give you a, a loan modification help you with a short sale or a deed. So you, um, you need to take action. Um, in concluding the panel presentation, the education program, I would like to ask each panel member, starting with um, Rosemarie, do you have any final closing um, thoughts 
that um, you can share with the audience that might help them in the future if they're confronted with this issue? Well, first of all, don't put your head in the sand. Um, I know it, it's easy to do that because you're so frightened. Um, it's important to keep the communication open with your mortgage company. Um, if you're looking for legal advice, then you would contact an attorney. Um, when you're looking into the Florida Hardest Hit Program, know that the advisors uh, with credibility are uh, very knowledgeable and very helpful, and um, uh, and you can check out the website. You can read the information about the program. You can give us a call uh, to make sure that this program is right for you. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier that I wanted to mention before was that if you have filed bankruptcy, the bankruptcy must be discharged in order to be able to receive assistance. But, um, you know, just keep the communication open, give us a call, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, screen your situation and let you know uh, if you would be a good candidate for receiving this assistance. And how much do you charge for your services? Well, our sessions are free. We don't charge anything. <laughs> so you can't beat that. Right. And, and you have trained um, professional housing counselors. We most certainly do. And uh, if for some reason during the process, uh, if we find that it turns out you're not eligible for the assistance, we're not going to leave you out there hanging. Uh, we will definitely uh, uh, provide you with options that you do have. Uh, we also have a wonderful HOPE team of foreclosure prevention counselors uh, that can contact your lender with you on the phone and uh, assist you uh, with the various programs. So, um, you know, the thing of it is, is, is just take action and, and keep the communication open. All right. Steve? Sure. There are a ton of defenses to foreclosures, a ton. And there are a lot of tools in the arsenal. And you can use a lot of those within a foreclosure lawsuit and, and put a lot of pressure on the bank to get the result that you want to get. But at the same time, you mentioned it. There's bankruptcy, too. And bankruptcy is not defending a foreclosure. And it's not a solution to a foreclosure, but it is an option. And a Chapter 7 bankruptcy is, is essentially where you liquidate your debts. So if you didn't want to keep your house anymore and you just wanted to get away from it, and in my opinion, if you exhausted every chance to do that in a foreclosure um, case, then you might file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, you come up with a repayment plan where you might be able to actually reduce some of your debt there. So there's a ton of tools in the arsenal, and there are really good opportunities to get a good result in a foreclosure case. And it is definitely not, not a good idea to leave the home. I mean, everybody said it. Defend your case. Defend your home. That home, it may not be worth you know, what you owe. You may have a $100,000 home that, um, where you owe $200,000, but you still got $100,000 to negotiate with. You still got $100,000 to beat the bank over the head with, to force them to the table to negotiate. So the point is, there are defenses here. There are, are opportunities. And leaving a home isn't good for anybody. You know, a vacant home is bad for your community. It's bad for your neighbors. It's bad for the town, the city, the county, the state. Because vacant homes, bad things happen. That's why insurance on vacant homes goes through the roof. Vacant homes get squatted in. People move in that don't belong there. People squat in there. They vandalize the homes. They steal from them. They steal the copper out of the AC pipes. The yards aren't maintained. Um, if you live in a home and there's a leak, what do you do? You fix it. The home doesn't flood. It doesn't get ruined. If you don't live there, the home's destroyed. If you live in a home and you smell electricity... Well, and, and it smells like there's smoke coming from your electric panel. You flip the switch, you call the fire department, you get a fire extinguisher. If you don't live there, the house burns down. Vacant homes are bad for everybody. So there's not this guilt thing. The banks want you in this home because it's better to have somebody there than nobody there. So, so don't think about this as the right thing or wrong thing. It's good to stay in your home because you're actually taking care of it. And really, when you defend a foreclosure, you're exercising your rights to, to defend your property. And that's it. 
Thank you, Steve. Um, Yvonne. And I would reinforce what Rosemary said. Stay informed, stay educated. Don't just get up and leave. Don't bury your head in the sand. It's important that you stay focused, that you know what's going on, and that you apprise yourself of, of everything you can. There is free assistance. There are attorneys who are affordable should you not qualify for free assistance, but you've got to explore your options and know what they are. Um, I would reinforce what Steve said about bankruptcy being a potential option. There is another form of bankruptcy, Chapter 13, where you can seek a reorganization of your debts, seek a modification through that program as well. Um, but you've got to become knowledgeable about it. You've got to seek all the assistance available to you so that way you know what's going on. I would also say that there's a practical component to this. You may not pay your mortgage, but what if you have to leave? If you leave, you've got to pay rent somewhere. And the rent may not be less than a modified mortgage payment would be. So you've got to consider everything when you choose to make your decision. Maria? Yeah, I'd like to add that um, please remember mediation is an easy day. There's not a decision that's going to be made at mediation, nothing that is going to be forced upon you. However, it also provides you an opportunity to ask of the bank and the bank's attorneys any questions that you might have. The, it, one of the questions that frequently comes up when you're not represented with an attorney is the defendant, the homeowner, wants to know what stage in the litigation am I at? How soon are you going to have a foreclosure sale? Are, is it set for, for trial? Uh, is it set for summary judgment? Typically, the bank attorney will have access to the court docket right there at mediation on their laptop, and they'll be able to tell you that. They're very willing to do that. Also, you might want to know, what is my outstanding principal balance? Uh, was forced placed insurance, something that Steve mentioned, was that put on the home? Because typically, if you didn't have the money to pay your mortgage, you probably let the homeowner's insurance lapse. And forced place insurance is very expensive. And then you have the opportunity during your modification to try to get a homeowner's policy that you obtained so that you could present that. Because otherwise, when they escrow your taxes and insurance on a modification, that amount may be very high on your, mo on your monthly payment. And even though they may reduce your interest rate, the forced place insurance might drive that monthly payment up where it is almost what it used to be before the modification. So you might want to ask that question and try to look for that on your own if you want to modify your loan. Mm -hmm. so. One other item that I did want to bring out, and I wanted to ask Yvonne to, to address it. Um, when is the last possible moment that you can stay in a foreclosed home? In order for the lender or a purchaser at a foreclosure sale to remove you um, or a tenant that you have in possession of your property, the court has to issue what's called a 24-hour writ of possession. When the writ is posted on your door, you have 24 hours to vacate the property, and you've got to remove your belongings as well. If you do not vacate at that time, you will be removed, and you will lose whatever belongings remain in the property, so that's an important thing to look for. I would say, though, um, that that may be the very last step, but you need to be aware of what's going on should you be occupying the property. So you need to be looking for the final judgment of foreclosure. After that, that final judgment will contain a sale date within it, typically 60 to 90 days out from the final judgment. And if the home is sold, there's going to be a certificate of sale issued, and approximately 10 days later, there will be a certificate of title. That certificate of title is the document that changes ownership of the home. That is the time where you should really be looking for a place to leave should you have not, or, or pardon me, a place to go, should you not have already been exploring that. All right. I'd like to interject um, Steve, there. Yes. And, and before that root of possession is issued, um, you know, we've taken cases where a certificate of title happens after the home is sold. And that's when actual ownership of the property changes hands. Even after that point, even after there's a judgment, a sale, a title change, even after there's a writ of possession, we've still come in and brought people back from the grave, essentially. We've brought people back, we've vacated sales, we've vacated judgments, we've vacated defaults, which is where you lose. It's a lot harder to do it that way, but there's still always an option. It just gets a lot, lot harder the farther you get in, the further you get into your case. So that's why it's important to, to defend it from the beginning. Um, but, you know, really wise advice on, on what to do once the writ of possession is issued. But even after that, or even in a, before that, still might be worthwhile talking with somebody. All right. 
Thank you so much, um, panel members, for sharing your time, your knowledge, your expertise. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you, um, audience, for being present. And um, we hope that you learned um, how to defend your legal rights and what your options are in foreclosure. We do have information about our contact on the slide. If you want to contact any of the panel members, feel free to email us at administrator at scbalas.com. I can get you that information. Feel free to call us at 407-834-1660, and we will be happy to help you. Take action. Don't close your eyes. Thank you.